semi-serious thing to go, I, you were one of the first people I got in touch with. I don't know if you remember. Uh, probably not. I mean, it's the, the throng of people contacting you. And I thought, wow, this guy looks very interesting. You know, um, one, there's, um, there's a First Nations aspect, which I know is very appealing to lots of Europeans because there's some, um, let's say, stereotype of authenticity mixed into that. Yeah. That sort of say, oh, look at this guy, First Nations, he's got to be on the ball. Um, and for what it's worth, you know, it, it, sometimes it's true or not with the individual, of course. But um, I, I like that those paintings that you sent me, the Zuniqua and the Bukwus, uh, the, the local, the tribal art, and I thought, that's great. That really ties in with a lot of the stuff I've seen drawn in Australia and, and other places, and some of the Woodwose depictions here in, in their form. Yeah. We've got these carvings <clears throat> from the medieval period all over our churches and our cathedrals and our tapestries, and, and these hairy men carrying clubs. And, um, yeah, it interested me. I wanted to talk to you. And I thought today we could just lay it out on the table. You could tell us about the Zinnikwa and the Bookwurst and everything else that's within your world, how you came to it. Roger, Roger. So when do you <laughs> want to, whatever I'm, when are we starting? We started. Oh, okay. We well, there started. we go. So that I always sneak that little recording button in and just make it nice and natural. Nobody knows what's going on. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just, you know, being a Kwakwaka'wakw you walk First Nation from northeastern Vancouver Island, British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada, you know, it's, we didn't think twice about it. You know, when we were kids, you, you heard the stories about uh, the boogeyman, but our boogeyman was uh, Chonakwa, the wild woman of the woods. You know, I remember hearing it when I was a young kid, you know, behave yourself. Chonakwa is watching you. She's right out there in the bushes, always watching you, Kinganatam, which means children. And she's not allowed to touch you, but if you misbehave, you don't listen to your parents, you whine and snivel, you pull a temper tantrum, you steal, you get in a fight. Well, Jonah is going to come at night when you're sleeping. She's going to reach big hairy arm into the tent you're, where you're sleeping or out on the boat through the porthole or in your bedroom window. And she's going to grab you and she's going to rub spruce sap. You know, it's a tree out here, an evergreen mm -hmm. tree branches break and the sap runs like sticky syrup she's going to rub that in your eyes so you can't open them and you're blind and she's going to put you in that basket in her back or in your sack that she carries and she's going to carry you into the forest high up the mountain to her invisible home that's why we can't find her the sasquatch and she's going to boil you up and eat you so you behave yourself because the Jonah was watching you, Tommy. And I remember that. And I remember how wow. scary it was. And, <laughs> and then as you're growing up, you when you get a little older and your parents bring you to the big potlatch ceremonies in our ceremonial big house, you know, equivalent to our cathedral, our chapel, our mm -hmm. university, our theater. It's where our celebration of life that the chieftains hold. And they mm -hmm. open up what we call their gildas, their symbolic box of treasure. And in that box of treasure, every chieftain in their clan and family have crests. Everything from Kwikwikwinala, the thunderbird, to Kwawina, the raven. And mm -hmm. uh, animals, natural, supernatural, from the spiritual realms as well. Like Kwik, uh, like uh, the ghost world, which is Bokwus, you know, the small mm -hmm. little hair-covered creature who's a protector, keeper of the ghost world. And you see their crests come to life and dance and song on the big house floor of dirt around a fire. And every post of cedar, you know, two meters thick, carved of crest figures and with firelight. You can imagine that the fire flickering and a thousand people sitting in there shoulder to shoulder upon the benches, the tears. And around that fire, you see these crests come to life in dance and regalia the outfits they're wearing of the animal or the bird or whatever, the spiritual form. And then you would see that one where the big hollow cedar drum that the drummers pound on with wooden batons mm. and it's hollowed out log a meter thick. So the drumming, this makes the walls shake and the benches shake. And out of the camellias, the screen, you see this big hair covered creature come backing out 
and it's got long hair and fur on its regalia and and as it comes out in the basket on its back it'll turn around do an anti-clockwise circle and as it enters the floor it'll rub its eyes because it's tired and it'll put its hands up and whoop 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 making that whooping noise and it'll come onto the dance floor this big hairy bipedal creature and it'll represent throwing the children in its basket rubbing its eyes because it's tired yawning because it's tired and whooping the noise it makes what you're seeing is that jonah come to life and dance and song and behind it you see these great cedar tr- logs carved of thunderbirds eagles whales grizzly bears sisu double-headed sea serpent horizontally mm-hmm. across above where the chiefs and the drummers are drumming and singing in deep baritone voice you're watching the world where these creatures come from be it natural or spiritual and you're seeing the chief and his family's interpretation of an ancestor having an encounter with a sasquatch a jonah mm-hmm. and it's just amazing and it's it's always depicted as a female in that element of the potlatch but on memorial potlatches when you go to them and a young man who's worked with his family after their chief has passed for three years and mourning they work and they accumulate food and they make masks and regalia for the masks and they get in these modern times over a hundred thousand dollars worth of gifts that they purchase and that's a potlatch you witness the opening of the treasure and all the societies and dances and it takes place all through the day and into the deep night and at the end when the speeches are being given and they put plastic tarps on the dirt floor and they bring out all those gifts and your belly's full from the food Mm. that that family gave you and that chieftain (laughs) then and only then will you see a helicom a chief speaker stand up and in front of everyone that's our congress that's our Mm -hmm. parliament and he proclaims you have all feasted on the food that this chieftain and his family have prepared and made for you you have all witnessed this chieftain open his, or this man open his family's gildas, box of treasure, and share with you all of their crests and societies and come to life and dance and song. You've seen them at the beginning of the potlatch have the morning service for the family members that have passed. And it's been many years since this family has had a potlatch. So this one you witnessed all of the newcomers into the family and the ones that came by birth or by marriage that have received the names from the gildas of the box of treasure of names of this family. But you have all witnessed this man do all what he was supposed to do in honor of the chief who had passed on three and a half years ago. So if no one here can contest that he has done everything honorably and right, mm-hmm. then he shall be the leader of this family clan. And that's when you'll see the male Chonachwa with a mustache uh-huh. put on his face. And that's the acknowledgement that he is now the clan hereditary chief uh-huh. of that family. And that is the only time you'll see the male Chonachwa that I know of. You know, I could be wrong, but, you know, I've never been to a potlatch and seen a male Chonachwa on the floor. And it's only the female we see, either with her basket or her sack. My family, Mm -hmm. sometimes we dance it with this no basket or sack because that's our interpretation. Every Mm family is different. Every chief's potlatch is different. So all my life, I went up to the potlatches. And, of course, I moved to the city when I was pretty young. And, you know, I didn't go to that many potlatches. But in my later years, when I was out of school, you know, I'd go to them, you know, he'd be in mm. Alert Bay or Campbell River, commercial fishing, because that was my career. In 45 mm-hmm. years, I've done it. And you'd hear, you know, you'd see all the cute looking girls coming off the ferry or walking around going, hey, oh, that's right, too. There's a potlatch on. Yeah, we better go up there later on. And you go up there and you don't need an invitation. You don't, there's no invitation open. Part sent out. It's open for all. And we go there and you might have to stand outside and smoke your cigarette and hear the drumming and singing or speeches. And then all of a sudden it stops and the doorman opens the door and everyone's coming in and out. And then you go take a seat and you witness the potlatch and you sit there for hours. And you will. I always go because I love watching. Sounds like um, it sounds like a really warm experience. 
a really warm experience. And the way you described the stories being told, especially for the, the mind of a child with the shadows and the light and the sound, that's going to really <laughs> stay with you. You must have had some dreams. As yeah. A child. But, you some know, nowadays dreams. with... Uh... You know, no offense to the people out there that aren't First Nation native, but, you know, white man's magic, the most powerful tool invented to date, the Internet, you know, social oh, media, yeah. YouTube. You know, you can go there and type in potlatch or quack quack you walk potlatch and, uh, you know, you can go to Sasquatch Island, my Facebook group and, you know, have a ask yeah. to join, sit down, go to the bathroom first, of course, because you're going to be so enthralled. You're going to be there for hours grab your tea and other beverage and sit down and scroll through. And you'll see the clips that I've taken from the link to, from the Umich to cultural center, our cultural center yeah. in alert Bay. And you'll see the YouTube clips of some very powerful chieftains talking about the difference uh, between a male and a female. Mm. You'll see the clips from different dances and YouTube, you can go and see the potlatch. You can type in Junakwa or Bukwis, and you can see the dances that have taken place. I can't link those because they're not my family potlatches, so it'd be no, disrespectful I understand, for But me, they're so. available. I yeah. mean, it's interesting to me as well that the um, the name of the uh, the male Junakwa has disappeared, and yet the face only comes out for the accession of the chief. We after actually the have period is at the, yeah, in our oh, language. Have a name. Popola, there is a name for that. Male. Oh, there is. Yeah, and uh, I I don't want to disrespect my ancestors or my people that are good with the language. That's not my forte is the Kwakula okay. language. It's uh, so I leave it up to them. You know, you can go on the Umich to Cultural Center U M I S T A dot C A. You can go to that cultural center, and they have some beautiful mm. videos of the Jonakha and Bakwas, the small yeah. one. Jonakha being the big one, the Sasquatch. And other dances, you know, you can see all kinds in there. I understand that uh, in respect to the language, of course. I, I I come from an Irish background and I grew up in Wales and I speak neither Irish nor Welsh. Um, although I do know speakers, so it's, um, oh, I, I can get by in certain respects. But again, I was raised similarly to yourself with English as my first language. So, you know, that, that has passed away. Um, it's It's interesting to me. And the perspective, I was thinking about the, the Celtic perspective, because essentially the Celtic peoples of Britain would consider them okay, and others came later, you see. And they have, especially in Ireland, but also in Wales and Scotland, they have these these mysteries, these folklores, that they tend to believe in, I would say specifically Irish, a lot more than their English cousins. They have kept that... that um, that bridge between folklore and reality, or they, they've kept that link between uh, assigning spiritual uh, significance to creatures that may in fact be real. And it's, you know, it's, it's a strange thing. And I, I, I think that I see a similarity in some First Nations cultures in the way you're describing this. He said the book was as a, a spiritual creature or it's a ghost-like creature. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that folkloric, inter that, that that spiritual interpretation of a possible real animal. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, to us, it's just, we refer to the Sasquatches, and it's in more, most of the North American Indian tribes, we refer to them as the other tribe. Mm -hmm. So in other words, working with uh, my good friend and my chapter president from Omaha Indian Reservation in central U.S. and Nebraska state, he lives on the Omaha Indian Reserve, and he's interacted with them. They actually basically looked after him when he was a young boy, and he ran away after his father died from the community because he was outcast, because he was a runaway kid. And out here in North America, we Indians hate two things and don't trust two things. Number one, the police, because they take your parents, and the social workers, they take your children. So... No one wanted to harbor him because their children would be taken away or the police would yeah. come and take them away. So he was pushed away, shunned. So in March, at 10 years old, he went into the forest of his Indian reserve. And that's where he lived. And he would yeah. sneak into the community at night, and take clothes from the clotheslines and sneak into the houses when people were sleeping to take food. Mm -hmm. And he lived out there in the Omaha Indian Reserve in the 
basically the forest and uh, it was Sitonga, their Sasquatch that looked after him and he had an interaction with them as a young boy. And I clued into that four years ago when I was met him because at night he would be crouched down and to me, he mm. looked like he was moving like little bugus, how he shuttle around and mm. scurry like a little bird and his hunches. And I was thinking, wow, there's something strange with this guy. And then I asked, <laughs> got to know him. And I said to him, I said, Lucas, I said, you lived in that forest every year from March until October when it got cold. Then you walked into town and were picked up by the police. The social workers took you to a foster home outside of the Indian Reserve who weren't Indian. And you lived there going to school doing what you're told, going to bed when you had to. But as soon as the weather warmed in March, you took a bunch of food, a bunch of money, and off you <laughs> went into the bush again until October. And you did that every year until you're considered legally a man at 18. And that was your MO. I said, but a 10-year-old boy up to 14 years mm. old doesn't stand a chance out there with the wild dogs, the pumas, the cougars, mm. and the uh, coyotes. I said, even badgers could probably rip you apart. I said, mm. the Sitonga looked after you. And he just looked down and he looked up. He goes, I listen to you. You're right. They are the other tribe. They have strict laws, Tom. And then he began to tell me things. Mm. They have language. They have culture. They have laws, Tom. Very strict laws. There is many things I have to tell you, but in time. So... Four years have progressed, but in the Indian way, it could take a decade to two decades for him to really open up with me. But I believe, mm -hmm. I, and I, when I came out, I emailed Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Dr. John Bindernagel, uh, Cliff Berrickman, mm -hmm. Todd Neese from the American Primate Association. So all of these big names in the Sasquatch Bigfoot world community, I emailed mm -hmm. them. I said, I found Tarzan, and I shared with them about Lucas. And right now we have Lucas with a uh, cheap uh, $300 FLIR attachment on an obsolete cell phone, smartphone, running around his homelands when he's not being restrained because of COVID and told to stay home. He's out there trying to get us pretty crispy, I call it. I don't want to use the term conclusive proof. I'll mm. just say real crispy proof on video of the existence of Sasquatch or what he calls Sitonga. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I've, you know, get people from time to time, you know, giving donations to us and that, and, you know, and that's what it's all about. Sasquatch Island. I'm all about, Hey, what about us? Us Indians, you know, we're here finding Bigfoot. Now there's expedition Bigfoot with my friend, Russell Accord. And, yeah. and then the list goes on all of the I Sasquatch Russell, Bigfoot Russell shows. Is my agent. I yeah. Know yeah. And then you get an Indian on their shows usually, and it's usually a concrete Indian who knows Jack Bugger all about the bush world, like me and Lucas and others, who's got camo on with a button ready to pop and take your eyeball out. He's so fat yeah. from eating pizzas and drive through. Uh. <laughs> and that's the Indian you see on the non native shows and the yeah. big name Bigfoot shows, if they even take the time to put an Indian on there. But who has the connection to the other tribe? Who knows to tell people that, number one, you don't ever think about going to kill them or capture them mm. because you have to always show them respect. My tribe, the Kwakwakiwak, my mother's side, the Cree from central Canada, they call them Witago. But what you do is you always respect them. So when you're in the mm. bush and all of a sudden you hear bang, 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 tree against tree, you stop, turn around, go back where you came from. Mm. That's it. The Sasquatch is telling you, stop. Me and my family are here right now. I don't want you here. So you respect them. You leave. When we go shellfish digging, because we share something out here in the Pacific Northwest, like you British people from the British Isles, we love our cockles. Mm. So we go to the beach for cockles, which is the favorite <laughs> food of not only the bakwas, the small one, but also the big one, the chunacha, uh -huh. because we hear them whoop, 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 calling from island to island. Probably saying, how's the dig digging for your cockles going? Oh, not bad. Oh, cockles are great. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so with us, when we go shellfish digging, generally the tides are in wintertime at night. 
when the big low tides are out for the cockles and the clams and the other shellfish. Mm. So you go there at daytime and the first thing you do on that higher tide at daytime is you go ashore and you go to the high tide mark and you look around on the ground. Mm. You're looking for track indentations in the gravel or sand. You're looking for a pile of broken cockle shells where they smashed them together mm. to eat the meat the night before and pile the shells up. The shells are telling you that the Jonachwa is harvesting cockles at this beach. So what you do is you get in your boat and you go a kilometer or two, one of the directions, left or right, south or north, east or west. And you go to that beach and you check it out. If there's no broken cockle shells, then Jonachwa is not harvesting there. So you can respect them by harvesting mm -hmm. on a beach that they're not harvesting at. So let's go back to the dance of the Jonachwa in the big house. When you first see it come out, it's oh, yawning, rubbing its eyes. Well, they're nocturnal. They're the humans mm. of the night. We hairless humans, I call us, because us Indians are pretty hairless. You know, I can count how many underarm hairs I got, and I think I got I'm the same. one on my chest. <laughs> you know, exactly you know, we're thoroughbreds, so we don't have much body hair. But so I call ourselves the hairless humans. We don't have nocturnal vision. <laughs> We're not robust and super big. And, you know, so in the old times, when you factor in glaciation, what was it like here? Here I am in Kent, Washington, just south of Seattle, where my common law wife lives. I live up in Canada most of the time. But here in Seattle, some, I guess, maybe 100 miles south of the Canadian border. What was it like here 5,000 years ago? Well, we know from pollen records through sediment sampling that the cedar trees and the shellfish beds didn't start to proliferate in the Pacific Northwest until about 6,500 years ago. Prior to that, and we have carbon dates going back 18,000 mm -hmm. years, and some can contest up to 23,000 and even 54,000. What was it like living here 6,000, 7,000 years ago? It was like living in the Arctic Circle. It was hostile. There was an ice mm. age that was just starting to thaw out. Go back 18,000 years ago, there was a kilometer thick ice when you look to the north. Listen to the Kwakwakiwa stories. We speak about going to the north end of the world where the ice fields begin. Well, that story goes back from British Columbia, northern Vancouver Island. That reference is 60 miles north. So the north end of the world where the ice fields began back in when that story took place mm. was some 60 miles <clears> up <throat> of Vancouver Island. Right now, the ice fields begin probably 1,600 miles north of Vancouver Island. Yeah, that's Island. right. So that's so, where the glaciation came to, essentially. Yeah, so Further when the down. glacier was in the northern hemisphere and you were living in the northern British Isles, mm. what was it like 6,000 years ago? It was equivalent to what it was like here in British Columbia, Washington State. It was oh, like yeah. Alaska, northern mm. Alaska. So, and our, our fossilized animals in. are proof of that. Woolly rhinos and, and mammoths yeah. and most of it. Yeah. yeah. Now you look at and, and they're woolly for a reason because it was bloody cold. You know, mammoths and mastodons, and woolly mammoth, mm. saber toothed tiger. But now you look at the humans. We know through the archaeological records that we humans of the day. We would evolve to be Stone Age with stone implements, spears, addles, I think they're called, those spear throwers, bows and arrows, knives, clubs, axes. But then we would progress into the Bronze Age where we had metal, copper and bronze, and then eventually we'd go into the steel, the iron and so forth. So here in British Columbia, the Kwakwakiwak people, our laws still to this day speak that back in the day, you couldn't just go to that beach and dig cockles because you mm. wanted to and you're hungry. That belonged to a family clan. If you uh -huh. went there and you were caught, whether it be a shellfish beach, a fishing site, uh, in-river fishing site, a uh, harvesting area for deer, bear, a clover patch, a slalberry patch, you could be killed with no retaliation to the offending tribe because they weren't offending. They were protecting their food source. So now you equate this big hair covered bipedal creature that I firmly think tens of thousands of years ago 
the humans, after they began to stand upright and weren't dragging their knuckles no more, I think some of them were looking around the chieftains and they're going, hey, look at this, 90 degree corners in this big house we live in, a central fire, mm. uh, bentwood boxes filled with people's treasure, hence Gildas, box of treasure, family possessions. And then, of course, we have the tier structure now because we have leisure time and we have hate, animosity, fear, thievery. Look at all this bad that's going on. Our stories tell us that a quite a few generations ago, we didn't have 90 degree corners, mm. tools, possessions, animosity, hate, warfare, all of this negativity. So as the chief of this clan, I order every one of you to go to sleep because late tonight when everyone in the village is sleeping, we're going to get up and we're going to go back into the forest and we're going to go live more harmonious with nature, with Eka Gekame's creation, with mm -hmm. the creator's creation, the forest, the rivers, the fish and everything. And we're going to stay away from this pettiness, jealousy, hate, fear, sloth, you name it. We're breaking all, as you would, as an analogy, it, we're breaking the Ten Commandments, so to speak. Yeah, well, I think so. And it's, it's and, and two questions. One would be, and does it happen, this philosophy? Do people, um, see, my, my, my feeling now about most First Nations people, as in all other peoples in the world who are from societies that, that hadn't modernized in the past, is that everybody is where we are now, you know, with the internet and doing everything and living in this right angled housed world. You know, we all live like that now, where we can, whenever we can. Now, I'd, I would expect that even in your tribe and others, that especially the young people are very modern and perhaps don't have many of the desires or the skills that you still retain. Is that 1991? Yeah. Some things happened in my life. I didn't go to jail or go to court or anything. But as I look at it, no offense to you people from England, but uh -huh. I got sick and tired of the Canadian colonialistic way of living and laws. They were browbeaten and suppressing this Indian left, right, and center. Like I hear they're terrible. Like yeah. colonialism was yeah. intended to do in Canada and elsewhere, but only speaking for Canada. This it Indian finish. got sick and tired of pompous colonialism. And I had bills coming in letters that I owed $170,000 in Revenue Canada bills. And I went to the wow. accountant, found out the accountant that conned us all got murdered in the city down south. And, mm. You know, he basically buggered 187 of us Indians and basically forced me to be bankrupt. Mm. I had Aware nothing. Yeah. I'm losing. We're not an honorable, upstanding citizen in this modern world unless we have a class one credit rating and a platinum credit card and equity coming out the years and a registered retirement savings and plan. The, retirement. And the right opinions, Tom. And I looked at all that yeah. and I said, the hell with this pompous yeah. colonialism way of life in Canada. Everywhere I look, I'm looking at the queen on a coin or a bill and look what it's done to me. So I got a ride on a boat and I went into my traditional tribal territories. I yeah. stepped off that boat with my guns, my fishing gear, my sleeping bag, my tarps, my boots. And I walked into the bush and I went to live tribally. And it was nine years later yeah. when I come out. And you know yeah. what? Out there in the bush, the only thing you're worried about is I've got to make sure I wake up when the tide's low in the middle of the night so I can go get mm. some cockles. You don't <laughs> worry about mortgage payments and bill payments and credit card payments. And that is unpriced. You cannot put a price tag yeah. on that freedom. And yet there's so yeah. many people that want to find Sasquatch. And what's the first thing they're going to do, and I'm afraid of, when they find Sasquatch? They're going to try to shove that Bible down its throat sideways and save its heathen soul. And then they're going to try to make it for clothing because, God forbid, your genitalia can't be out there in the open no leave them be let them stay out there because i've lived with them out there i know what it's like it's beautiful it's what utopia do you think, <laughs> what do you think uh, i think that's i have a lot of respect for that now as far as the queen's face on a coin goes a lot of people here in britain 
don't know that the Queen is the Queen of other countries. Do you know that they don't know that she's the Queen of Australia and New Zealand and Canada and a bunch of other places. Sixteen countries, I think. They they don't realise it. They think she's just our Queen. And most of us aren't even comfortable with that fact. Um, and especially if you're from a Celtic place like I am, or a mix of two Celtic places, you're even less comfortable with that fact because she's a kind of a German queen in an English body, you know, in our world. I've got nothing against her compared to the rest of her family. She's been reasonable, reasonably quiet enough anyway not to offend us that much. But, um, you know, it's one of those things when you get that and if you have the skills, you get that feeling and you go back to nature. I think it changes people. I've never done it. I've always been a city boy. I live just outside of London now in a, an area called Surrey. It's very green, but it's nothing like what you would experience. And um, I don't think most people would have the skills to survive. But second, I don't think most people have the courage to do it. And if they did and they got through, it would probably make us better all over, wouldn't well, it? Yeah. You just got to do like your national hero, Peregrillus, and drink your urine. (laughs) In all honesty, we all. He does it even when he doesn't have to. (laughs) (laughs) We all have our skill set that the law of the bush is the strong survive. And that's, you know, in our society, of course, we don't have that. We coddle and treat and inject with pharmaceuticals so that we all survive. See, to me, with even though we have COVID going on right now, and here in Can- in Canada and the US, Washington State, you know, it's all about losing your freedoms. And, you know, right. we're a year into this now. So my belief is, mm. where's the bodies? Well, I would like to, yeah. Yeah, I want there's to no see bodies. The so that being mm. said, let's either lock down like New Zealand and Australia and do like the Philippines and any offenders got to go swing a shovel and dig graves for the ones who did die and do like India, India, anyone that's out there and not supposed to be beat them harshly with a stick multiple times until they get off the streets. And for the bad offenders do like rocket man did in North Korea, shoot them. That's how he controlled his pandemic. Mm. It never did blossom and come into anything. So I'm saying that's what the world of Sasquatch is like. It's mm-hmm. harsh. So a lot of people here in North America, we speak of rogue Sasquatches. Okay. What is a rogue Sasquatch? Yeah, then we look that? at Pylades or whatever his name is with missing 411. Mm-hmm. Well, we know that there's thousands of humans going missing in North America. And nothing. the, the odd one gets found, you know, probably mm-hmm. natural causes or hypothermia, heart attack. Bear, cougar, cougar, wolf, bear. But yeah. generally, if a bear gets you, there ain't going to be no bones to find. So no. the ones that they do find with bones and a little bit of clothing, it wasn't a bear. Because a bear grabs mm. a skull like a wolf does and pops mm. it like a grate and eats everything inside, including the bones, except for the jaw in most cases. So what I'm getting at is Sasquatches live the way we used to live. So in other mm. words... The law of the bush, the nature's law dictates that you can't be the head of a clan spreading your seed because it weakens a genetic pool and strengthen a clan. So a younger, more robust, stronger male will come up and topple that head Sasquatch. Well, that Sasquatch either stays at the fringes of the clan eating the scraps or he goes out on his own. So me, when I was pummeled by the clan, the pack Mm -hmm. in 1991, I chose to go rogue. I'm leaving the concrete and going into the bush. Mind you, I had a gun, Mm -hmm. metal tools and everything, but I went into the bush. And the Sasquatch has got muscles, right? (laughs) Yeah, well, I went out and I got more muscles, definitely. No, what I mean is um, you had your tools and he has his. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, there's, you know, so many different things. But the main thing is, is survival the, mm-hmm. we all forgot the code book and that's nature's code book that mm-hmm. the strong survive and you don't coddle the weak see i'm a firm believer of don't coddle the weak where i've been in debates with some people and they just look like at me and go you're a heartless bugger mm, call it like you will but we indians were brought up with the trail of tears so that in the old times prior to colonialism when you got old or weak and decrepit and diseased, 
you left the clan. You mm -hmm. went out into the bush on your own and more than likely succumbed to the elements, the animals, mm -hmm. or your weakness and age, disease, and you died. Why did you do that? To strengthen the clan. Look mm -hmm. at us now. You know, we have forgotten that. Sasquatch hasn't. And that's why we can't find Sasquatch. How can you go to war when you're weak? And when can, How can you go to battle and expect to win the war when you're weak? So here mm -hmm. we are wanting to go. Some people want to go in and wage war with the Sasquatch and the level of conclusive proof for them, interacting with them. I'm trying to get an interaction like a Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey moment with a mm -hmm. Sasquatch to get conclusive proof. And the only reason for that is to protect them so mm -hmm. that we can say... Hey, guess what? We now know Sasquatch exists in North America. So these areas where we wanted to shove the pipeline, these areas we wanted to go clear, mm -hmm. these areas we wanted to push more urban sprawl, we're going to have to start looking at the way we live here in North America. We live where we go out horizontally. Yeah. And whereas in Hong Kong, as a good example, they learn to go up. Mm. Well, eventually, we in North America are going to have to factor our way of living to going up instead of out. Because as we go out, we do urban sprawl. We poison the salmon streams with our runoff from our vehicles and antifreeze and oil. And now yeah. they just found here in the Pacific Northwest that one of the biggest contributing factors to the probably the extinction of one or two of our species of salmon, the Chinook and the Coho, is attributed to rubber microscopic whatevers in our water from the tires on our vehicles running off into the streams. Um, so that's what I mean by this. I'm trying to find conclusive proof of the existence of Sasquatch as far as videos go. I would never try to harm one. That's against mm -hmm. my culture and beliefs. Same. But to have a Diane Fossey moment and say, with there with the cell phone, everyone's got one now. And to get them to a point where you can get them to yeah. open their mouth and take video of their molars and their cavities and their tissue structure in their mouth. Picture of the innards of their year. Picture of their video of their palms or the epidermal ridges on their feet. You come out of bush with that because you had a Diane Fossey Jane Goodall interaction moment with a Sasquatch. Where there is the, the conclusive proof of the existence of Sasquatch. Now, there's, there's conspiracy theories about that that are always going around about loggers and uh, oil magnates that don't want it to be discovered Sasquatch that there's because of the environmental cost of losing oil pipeline routes or losing forestry. Do you think there's anything in that or do you think that really Sasquatch is so difficult to find that essentially it's not that the government is hiding anything, it's just they don't really know, same as us. They don't have the proof that they need. Because Art Bell, everyone that's listening to your podcast knows of Art Bell. He's no oh, longer course. with us. But yeah, I remember right. back in the early 1990s, us young bucks sitting around the FM radio, carving native carvings and painting mm. and listening to Art Bell once a week late at night. Awesome. We listened to one in 1991, I believe it was, how he, there was a guy with his voice changed on the interview who had worked in surveillance for the U.S. military in uh, test ranges down around Area 51 or someplace like that. And they had tunnels underground where they witnessed family units of Sasquatches living in there, eating, bringing in, bedding, and so forth. So he observed on shift how they sealed the gates and the entryways and the inside mm -hmm. gates, and they sent in gas and they put them to sleep. And on surveillance camera, you witnessed these big hair-covered humanid-type creatures all tied down being brought out. And that was the last mm. of them. So wow. when you think and follow things like I do pertaining to Sasquatch, t 10 years ago in North America, we started to see the existence of body cameras. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, body cameras exploded. Well... At the same time period as the creation and the wrecking and the divulging of these body cameras, well, you started hearing about the drug people in Bolivia and Colombia reporting Sasquatches raising havoc with their 
cocaine manufacturing way out in the jungles, hair covered and so forth. So any military, if you have your special forces and you guys have your special SAS there Mm -hmm. in England, we have used to have our 52nd Airborne in Canada, where it's now just, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but in the U.S. it's the Army Rangers, the SEAL Mm -hmm. teams, and so forth. Well, your special forces agent doing reconnaissance of a compound gets killed. Well, now you got to go lie to the family. You got to cover up the story, yada, yada, yada. And it's just a big cluster beak, what they call Mm. a snafu in North America. But all of a sudden, and we know from the Day of the Dolphin with George C. Scott movie from the early 1970s and the bestseller back in the Mm. late 1960s, that in the late 1960s, they were training dolphins to go with a needle and hypodermically poison scuba divers. They were also wow. trained to have a magnetic mine on their back mm, to go under a ship or a submarine yeah. and attach it so you get a kaboom and a sinking. Well, if they were doing that to dolphins, and we know already that they are doing it with dolphins and pilot whales and orcas mm. and sea lions and seals, and we know that's part of the Navy arsenal nowadays. Well, isn't it conceivable to say that if they did have Sasquatches and they were able to breed them, artificially inseminate, test Mm. tube or whatever, and take the juveniles that are going to be far stronger than a human, they have nocturnal vision, they're hairier, which means infrared can't pick them up that good, Mm. as we've proved with our flurs all the time. And now all of a sudden, because they have laws, Tom, very strict laws, Mm. well, maybe they don't have the use or will they ever pick up a pen or a camera hence the body camera send your sasquatches that are trained to go in and do the recon looking over fences looking into windows mm-hmm. well the body camera is going to pick all the data you want with gps positioning so to me you know there's not even a conspiracy theory on that i guess you could say what i just came up as a conspiracy theory well i mean but that's, now you look at the that's... question. Do you want the Chinese? They got Yaren, mind you, and Yeti. Do you want the Russians? Well, they got Al Masadi and they got mm. Yeti. Well, do you want the South of Americans down in Brazil and that have it? Well, no, they got their own critter down there. Oh, mm. the Australians, they got a special force team and they got Yowie. Oh, in Indonesia, well, they got uh, Orang Pendek and a big one in there as well. So, And then Africa, it, so Asia. See what I'm getting yeah. at? So but why do you, don't do you, you want the conclusive be... proof of Sasquatch being proven? Because number mm. one, they might be using them for military applications, and they probably are by now. And the other one is marbled murrelet and spotted owl here in the Pacific Northwest. Mm. In the 1980s, 1990s, it took away millions of hectares of land okay. to be developed for forestry, mining, urban sprawl. That's the one I'm thinking of. See? With the environmental movement being so strong, something like that living in significant numbers in North America would, would close down logging for good. But my other thought about this is the environmental movement in the body worldwide and internationally is so strong. So many governments seem to want it. It seems to be strange that it wouldn't be used as a good excuse to shut down the outdoors, you know, large swathes of the outdoors to to people. They seem to be wanting to do it all the time. At least if you look at what's happening, it it always appears to be moving that way. In England and the UK, it's the same, moving that way that greater and greater areas of the outdoors become less accessible or protected in some way. But Um, it's like, now let's look at it this way. And I know about the British Isles and Norway and elsewhere. I'm the president of Pacific Balance Marine Management. And for the listeners, Mm -hmm. go look at it. It's a Facebook group. Ask to join. I'm the president of the British Columbia First Nations push and the group of us in our organization campaign to see the reestablishment, redevelopment of our seal and sea lion harvest in British Mm -hmm. Columbia waters and Helping out with Washington State. Oh, I saw Oregon, this. California. They're eating up all the fish. It's just like they are in the yeah. British Isles. Yeah. Because yeah. we have these worst invasive species to North America called environmentalists mm. trying to tell us that those round eye, beautiful whisker faces shouldn't be shot, eaten, made into pet food, made into oil for pharmaceutical, and the hides worn on beautiful clothing. 
Why? Because they are the worst in space of species to the Turtle Island, the North American indigenous continent mm. that was prior to contact. And you guys have the same thing in Europe. And why do we call it Pacific balance? Because everything in the laws of nature are a balance. And that's what we've forgotten. You know, look at Sasquatch. You know, they have laws, Tom, very strict laws. We don't hear stories about Sasquatches with rifles and modern axes and knives and broken bottles to stab you in the face mm. because they have harmony with their environment and they don't interact with us. Why not? Well, right now we're contaminated just like we were with Spanish flu, smallpox, influenza, tuberculosis, and the list goes on. So Sasquatches don't come close to humans because they hate us. They despise us. They loathe us. Look out your window in Pacific Northwest and all of North America. And if I was a Sasquatch, I would hate us too for what we've done to the environment. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a very interesting perspective to have that they hate us they despise us i thought they would avoid us because they're intelligent and well, that too. An intelligent animal would would clearly see that we're something to be avoided um and that, that to me stands out you know we're, oftentimes when we're, we're when we're in the woods we're hunting as well so we appear as hunters you know, we have we have weapons you know we have tools that could harm them but I'm, what I'm confused about is, the, is is what they are. Now, everything that people seem to describe seems to show an ape-like intelligence and an ape-like regard for them. As gorillas have, Diane Fossey mentioned, you know, it took a, a long time to earn their trust, you know, to, to slowly, slowly, quietly, gently move in. She didn't go into the woods in camo gear. She made sure she could be seen. She was bright, you know, she was uh, standoutish, so that they, they knew she was there. Would you suggest that's, that's perhaps the best way to seek Sasquatch? Because you're not going to fool it. You're not going to sneak up on Sasquatch, are you? It has to know you're there and that you're, you're no harm, or at least interesting enough to come and check out. What are There's your thoughts? three areas, and I call it bush dancers. So mm -hmm. when I first met my partner here over 13 years ago something captivated me with her aside from her eyes like a wolf and her beautiful things that most people fall in love with when they find their mate for life mm -hmm. but there was something I knew captivated me and it wasn't until we finally after being friends for a few years committed to one another and we went mushroom picking for chanterelle mushrooms in the forest and she was walking and that's when I noticed her floating fluttering moving with grace through the forest and i knew what captivated me the first day she walked up that bank of that abandoned indian village where i was at and i was sitting on one of my picnic tables she was bush dancing she was at ease and calm in the wild mm -hmm. bush world i lived in so sasquatches i know watch us and when they see tom walking around there not looking where his footsteps are because he's looking five meters out where his footsteps will be 14 steps later when he's looking up in the trees and he spins and looks behind him and he's touching things and moving it with grace. The Sasquatch looks and he sees me with a gun on my back and he goes, Hmm, that person is at ease and calm in the forest world hmm. or beach world. It has a rifle. Well, it's not in my best interest to get him angry with me. I have nothing to gain. So he grabs that branch as he's looking at you and he pulls it down and even further and then he lets it go and he turns and he walks away mm. and the branch bounces. And when I ask that of people, when I investigate, you ever notice that and you look and there's no bird, there's no mm. raccoon, there's no baby bear, no baby cougar, but that branch is, yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, I have, that's Sasquatch telling you. I'm going that way. You go about your business. I mean you no harm. You mean me no harm. Respect. It's respecting you as the human. So mm -hmm. when the Sasquatch looks out and he sees that wearing the fancy neon mountain equipment co-op and the 
camouflage hat like I got on with the Canadian flag. And they got the water bottle and they got the backpack with the plastic hose and they got the yeah. bear bells and they got the $500 boots and they're just making a ruckus and they're stumbling, tripping and slipping. And then the Sasquatch is just standing there going, you're not a threat to me. Whoa. <laughs> and it walks away laughing going ah, ha, ha, I just scared a human that's what I think happens yeah. so when you talk about loggers, miners, fur trappers, prospectors, hunters mushroom pickers Indians out in the bush we're not in their best interest to come interact with mm -hmm. so they either just fade away or run across our path and they're gone or else they respectfully bounce that branch and disappear into the foliage. Mm. So from my years, decades out in the forest, that's what I've come to a conclusion of. So when I'm out there, I know that I'm not going to see a Sasquatch. But when I go out there with my Fleur, my trail cameras, my ca Peggy just ordered a camcorder that has night vision capabilities. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good for up to like 50, 60 meters. And we're doing this investigations and we got all this different equipment and gopros and you name it it's to get that conclusive hopefully video proof but at the same turn i'm turning the tables on them i have electronics i have the mm. advantage now because one of the things i learned one time when i was out in bush is we were getting probed we we're building cabins on an island uh, out in the middle of timbuk nowhere and mm. uh I told my crew, two natives, I said, keep your eyes open. I said, this Chonach is probing us. I'm noticing trails open up coming into the edges of our camp. And we, our garlic's going missing from where we keep it. They love eating garlic. Now, I've noticed uh -huh. a few apples have gone missing and, uh, so, and potatoes. So we're being probed. And then I snuck out one night. And my crew, we all seen them. You know, we saw a young juvenile. I saw a young juvenile and we saw another one and they were throwing sticks at night and they were bothering us too. They, we, you know, they didn't want us there basically. Mm -hmm. So one night I, we were raking leaves in the summertime, a September, end of August, September into October. And I told the crew when the winter rains come, the monsoons of end of October, we'll light up all these piles of debris and burn it so we don't have a forest fire. But this one pile of leaves, don't touch it, leave it. And then that one night, just as it was getting dark, I grabbed my rifle and I snuck out the window and told my worker, don't do anything, stay right there. And don't be shooting at any noises. That'll be me if you hear a bunch of noise. I snuck out with my firearm and I went out the window. Didn't go out the front door because they're watching you. They always got scouts on you. I went out the opposite side of the building and I slinked on my belly and I crawled to the forest and I used all the big berms of leaves and debris to cover me. Because I strategically placed them like mm. that. And behind my camp, at the entrance to a trail leading to our outhouse facility in the forest, I crawled into the leaves and I was sitting up against a tree all covered in my leaves. Within 20 minutes, this juvenile Sasquatch come out and grabbed a tree with his arm, his left arm, and he leaned with his right leg. And it was about a two meter high berm. He stepped down onto the trail. And as he stepped and he was looking at my cabin, I shot out of the leaves some two meters from him and went, hey, that Sasquatch <laughs> went, ah, jumped up on the bank. That tree he was hanging on sprung and leaves were falling down. He looked at me and he just Rah! turned and he sounded like a freight train running through wow. the bushes, snapping trees. I had put the jig on him, we call it. I had turned mm. the table. I had used everything to my advantage that he didn't expect and I captured him. With those two eyes, laughing away, I stood up, lit a cigarette, and I walked towards the cabin, and I opened the door, and my worker was there with big eyes and big teeth. What the heck's going on out there? I'm like, settle down, <laughs> put the gun down. I just put the jig on the Sasquatch, scared the bejesus out of him. And that's what I'm doing, trying to get them again. And okay. I've seen them probably close to a dozen times. You know, I lived out in Bush, and it's just like anything out there. It's out there. Give you it, see them, smell them, hear them. A, dis a general a general description the, the juvenile for example i'm always interested in, in the face the face is is flat it's not protruding there's no muzzle or is it is it like a small muzzle almost with a separate nose and lips filtrum area here 
mm. is very pronounced. Uh -huh. So the distance between the upper lip and the bottom of the nose would be very pronounced. So that's uh -huh. where on my face, that that's kind of where, where my fingers are, would be where the mouth is. The uh -huh. opening of the mouth where my fingers are. That's how pronounced it is. Just like a chimpanzee or a gorilla mm. or a monkey. But the rest of it in regards to that is the nose is similar. In my, I'm only speaking my region, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. I can, but uh, when I was in Omaha, I saw two in a Fleur Scout 2 night vision. We were driving down the road and I was looking through it and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, 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 hey. And there was a pregnant female and a big male walking mm -hmm. across a field, some probably not even 100 meters from us at that at the most. And just like crispy, clear, greenish tone, night vision flur, what noticed to me was the bottom lips mm. hanging. And they had that big ridge on their, uh -huh. on their, above their eyes. Uh -huh. And the pronounced distance between the upper lip and the bottom one, but the bottom one was hanging almost like a cro magnon. And they were, their feet, when they walked, would come right up like that and then down mm. right up like that so you'd oh, see that's the this mid tarsal ridge you, well they'd be flat you yeah. just see the uh -huh. you wouldn't see no mid tarsal ridge you just saw this oh, okay. big just flat like okay so when it turned to 90 degrees and walked from us you could see the base of their soles mm -hmm. so i'm like a human lifting it up a little bit yeah. they were lifting them up like that and then the swing and that's what difference for me but then when i did the study and then i recommend this to you uh um listeners out there go to no offense white man's magic google earth number two's most powerful weapon <laughs> go to google earth and type in macy nebraska m-a-c-e-y macy nebraska omaha indian reservation on the southeast corner is macy of the indian reserve and it's all defined in google earth but then blow it up and you'll notice that the inside of the Indian Reservation, and there's three communities, Winnebago up in the northwest, Macy in the southeast, and I can't remember the other one in the north. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that whole Indian Reservation, up until a few years ago, they stopped logging it. So there's this, it's an enclave of hardwood forest, mm -hmm. chestnut and beech and cedar. But all around the Indian Reserve, it's like a checkerboard of farms in Iowa and in Nebraska. It's the breadbasket of the United States, except mm. for the Indians that were shoved in the confines of our Indian reserves. And the people said, we don't want to see or hear you, so stay in there. And we ignore you. So by ignoring them, they had their forests stay like they mm. always were. And it's a little enclave that has a lot of Sasquatch, Sitonga sightings. I've seen amazing things from the dash cams of the police cars, but because the head police officer is not Indian and all the police officers are Omaha tribe members, they showed me the clips and I was just like, mm. oh my God, like there's perfect running Sasquatch going across in front of the thing. There's one where the police officer hit the brakes and the tires are locking up and the dust comes forward from the gravel road when it comes to a stop and there's this big Sasquatch looking at the car like a meter in front of it and then just turns and boof so when you look at that enclave and then i thought about it and i thought oh my god the poor sitonga they can't adhere to nature's code that there should always be a stronger male taking over the clan so that the genetic pool is always strong mm -hmm. and i think that's why when i saw them Oh, it's starting to become that inbred. That hang lip, cro magnon type. Okay. Not as bright as, not the brightest apple in the box, so to speak. See, I wonder. Interbreeding. Think, yes, exactly. And the same with, with people. You get uh, in very small communities, you get these problems. There was the, these tales in certain parts, Florida and, and other places, of three toed Sasquatch prints. And, I can only uh, I can only speak for my regions. Mm, you know what's happening yeah, no. with Skunk Ape in Florida. Mm. I seen that picture from Florida. Yeah. Rougarou. That yeah. thing's spooky looking, man. That looks like an yeah. orangutan and it looks like it has canines. Glad like we a, don't like have those up here. Ours a little bit a little bit more mellower than that yeah, one. White bearded orangutan. It does look a, a lot more like a 
an upright orang, actually. That's true. It really does. But Florida, I mean, land of the lost, who even knows what's in Florida? There's so many invasive species and all kinds of things running around. You know, to me, that's that's a place of exploration as well, just for general wildlife. It's, it's a crazy like, place to be. It's like Mexico. When I went it's, to Mexico and, uh, yeah. and other places down there, they have those howler monkeys. Mm. Pronounced philtrum. Hoo, 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 yeah. hoo. You know, they're howlers. Well, yeah. when I went down there, I thought about it. I said, wait a second. We got monkeys in Central and South America. Yeah. We don't have them in North America, other yeah. than possibly the great Sasquatch. There a reason for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but how exactly. the heck did the monkeys get to South America and Central America? Well, they came over when the land bridge was in place. Mm -hmm. You know, and you got to remember, everyone always equates the last ice age. Come on, yeah. give your head a shake. You know, critters are coming back and forth into North America and out of North America for probably six ice ages back. The way these things are decided in science, it's, it always seems to be completely arbitrary because the evidence is fragmentary that they use to, to create these, these um, narratives of what happened. <coughs> yeah, exactly. of course, things would be fluid and um, increasing and decreasing and varying over time. Always. Mm -hmm. It's but the same if we look here. The Sasquatch equation on the Bering Land Bridge, you know, people always go, oh, that's where your ancestors came from. I'm like, come on, give me a break. Look at these shoulders. Look at these short little stubbly legs. Look at this big, huge beer belly on here. I ain't built for walking over no slippery mountain and glaciers. <laughs> I'm built for paddling a canoe. And that's how my ancestors got here from Polynesia, because yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of our culture, totally different podcast. And we came from Asia. Yeah. By going around the fingers of glaciers sticking out from the shore, we just paddled around it, camped out, ate a bit, paddled around the next one. Next thing you know, we're in Straits of Magellan in Patagonia, South America. So we know that's how the humans got here. Yeah. Well, you know, they've done the DNA study and not DNA, actually, they have done the DNA study and it's on the North American camel from a tooth. Well, they traced it back to Africa. Well, how did an African camel, mm -hmm. and what they speculate is the North American camel made it, because it evolved from a giant sloth okay. or something, but it made it to Africa. And so that's where they, the people who study camels, that's where they figure how camels migrated from the Americas into and Africa. So if that's taken place, well, isn't it conceivable to say that if Sasquatch, which mm -hmm. is possibly... There's possibly Gigantopithecus blackie, who maybe through the evolutionary raping of our woman has a little bit of human DNA in it. Why there's no conclusive proof. It's always DNA contaminated from humans Perhaps. or yeah. it looks it has uh, human uh, signatures in it. Mm. Well, could it Sasquatch possibly be even an evolved human to be nocturnal and roam more robust because they don't want tools thousands of years mm -hmm. ago, so they became Sasquatch, a bigger human? Or are they possibly from Gigantopithecus blackie? Now, if they are from Gigantopithecus blackie from Europe, which is the Yeti, mm -hmm. then it's conceivable to state that the hobbit, Homo florensis, migrated as well, which is our little people, a book, book with. book with in my language, mm -hmm. or stick people to other native North American Indians. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you have the skunk ape and the three-toed and the splayed-toed ones that is way out. Could mm -hmm. those possibly be an orangutan front that migrated over? So the I... camel and a rhinoceros mm -hmm. and an elephant uh, mammoth can migrate, and a crow. And no one ever thinks about mm -hmm. the crows. God, you got crows, crows in get the British Isles and ravens. You got crows mm -hmm. in Australia. You have crows and ravens in North America. No one ever equates that. And that's what I'm getting at. And then, of course, they call it the Asian brown bear. Alaska calls it the Alaskan brown bear. Mm -hmm. Canada calls it the grizzly bear. Uh, Montana calls it the brown bear. We the call tundra it the Eurasian northern bear. Canada call it the tundra grizzly mm -hmm. bear. And they even call them pizzlies because they're interbreeding with the polar bear and the grizzlies. Yeah. So they become pizzlies. So see what I'm getting at? I when think I, bigger when that happens. When you have the grizzly and polar bear breeding together, or are they smaller? Smaller. 
smaller than the polar bear, but pretty neat uh, looking. Definitely research. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is when we look at Sasquatchology, we can't be like your ancestors in the British Isles that came here. Now, I went to a Shawnigan Lake Boys private school, boarding mm-hmm. school in 1978, oh, wow. in grade, not, grade eight. And I had to, just like England, I looked like, mm. uh, what do you call it, the guitar player from ACDC. Had the tie, the, the tie blazer, and the blazer, shirt, and the black had the same thing. the yeah. gray pants, the British logos and everything. I belonged to Lonsdale's house. We had table fags, everything, every master mm. and headmaster prefects. was straight from England. Yeah, prefects. Mm. Mm. And rugby, of course. Loved rugby. I was on the first 15. But anyway, what I'm getting at is... I was to the fresh out of Liverpool, England headmaster, my first year in grade eight. He looked at me and uh, my two other cousins that were going there were pretty colonialized church. Mm-hmm. And they wore their shirts buttoned up to the top button. They were cityites. Here's little Sasquatch Bush Tommy showing up. <laughs> and through our headmaster, I was a heathen savage. And I was punished mm-hmm. by being put in the above his office in the Victorian age building, put in the attic in the heat of May with no air conditioner or window, locked in there, and I had to learn the British book of etiquette from cover to cover, weekend after weekend after weekend. And on the third weekend, he brought down his little supposed and rough heathen little Indian savage from British Columbia. He brought him down to the headmaster's formal uh, board of directors meeting. And with all the people with their pinkies out and cutting the right forks that I set up, he sat there as I'm serving everyone because I'm their table fag. And he looks and he goes, it's been such hard work with Master Seawood, but I have conformed them from a heathen little Indian savage into a properly following yada, 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 used all this big long terminology and this colonial pompous. I wanted to poke his Mm. eyes out. And this one man was just red. He was just cutting his potatoes and meat, and he was just raging. That man's family was tied to my grandfather, the late chief James All Seawood, who would have dinner and tea with the Queen of England and Buckingham Palace, who would be the member of Order Canada and win the medal and get delivered the medal because of his fight for native rights and equality. He was mm-hmm. Canada's equivalent to Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. And here was Rod Bell Irving on the board of governors, raging, listening to Mr. Farrant, the headmaster of Sean and Lake Boys Private School, say that I was a heathen savage. And I looked at him and he asked me what was the proper place setting for a formal dinner in the Buckingham Palace and he's all holding his suspenders bottom lip out mm. with no Sasquatches in Ohio and Omaha and he's all proud and pompous like that headmaster from Pink Floyd's The Wall oh, every time I see that I just want to wring that guy's neck <laughs> and then all of a sudden he goes I have done such a splendid job and all of a sudden Mr. Bell Irving threw down his cutlery and he looked at Farrant and he goes Mr. Farrant I'll have you know that Master Seawood comes from my father and my good friend, James All Seawood of the Kwakwaki Walk Nation. And he is never to be labeled what you just said. And how dare you? I walked over to the table and I grabbed this big Chinook salmon that was a full, Mm -hmm. you know, feast for them. And they'd eaten the tail and the good parts, but I had the head on it and the tail. And I looked at Ferret and I said, I am no effing heathen savage and i stuck my fork in its eyeball and i pulled it out and <clears throat> in my indian world that's the best part of any salmon and i plucked the second eye out and i ate it and mr bell irving goes tom you can excuse yourself from this dining room i said well i'm gonna go grab a plate sir and i went up to the window and i grabbed my plate of food and sat down and i looked back now mr ferrant was sitting there raging red and uh, humiliation and embarrassment <laughs> i thought you pompous arrogant ass i sure showed you that's so story. that's how we have to look at sasquatches just yeah. like your ancestors when they came to north america and the jesuits and other mercenaries are trying to shove the bible down our throat sideways and one hundred and twenty six million indigenous people between the europeans the spanish and others would eradicate us indigenous people in the Americas, South, Central, and North. 
and we have to look at the residential schools where now in 2020, I was at the conference in Vancouver mm. where UNDRIP, United Nations Recognition of the Indigenous People took place. And now mm. it's held up in parliamentary legislation mm. that UNDRIP must be adhered to when you're concerning the Indigenous people of Canada. I've heard about and that. That's yeah. how we have to look at Sasquatch. And so the teaching, what I'm passing on to everyone is number one, be respectful of Sasquatch, mm -hmm. but also know your history. So you're never destined to repeat its failures. And well, that's I how think we have to approach Sasquatch. I think those are wise words, uh, Tom. And I think wise words for the world presently, for all of us, looking at what's taking place in our world, know our history throughout the world so we don't have to repeat it. Um, I think we'll leave it there, but I've got to say that it's been eye-opening, enjoyable, and um, we're going to have to do it again. For everybody who's out there, everybody who's listening, listening just the, all the links will be in the description, but just give them a page somewhere, the main page where they can find you. And how they best can way is you. go to two places that are the best. Go to Sasquatch Island, my Facebook group. It's also a website, sasquatchisland.com. It's in construction right now, but you can email me through there and of course i have my own podcast series sasquatch island with monsterxradio.com i love I want it. Three yeah. team members so go to those links go to sasquatch island ask to join i'll accept you don't forget have a picture in your profile so i know you're not mm -hmm. a cyberbot. a lot of people That's don't right. put a picture in there big mistake you know put someone in there oh, and yeah. the other oh. one is uh Go to the bathroom, grab a beverage, sit down, enjoy Sasquatch Island. I know you will. Fantastic. Tom Sweet, thank you so much. I thank you very much. In my language, right. halakulisla. Go in peace. You too. Thank you.